Hello, welcome to the Carolyn Glick Show. It's my podcast, Carolyn Glick's podcast, but I'm doing it together with my extraordinary friend, one of Israel's top public intellectuals, Dr. Gadi Taub. He's a historian at Hebrew University. And as I said, a dear friend. We decided that we wanted to start this week after a long process of trying to figure out when we'd have time because today is Yom Ma'ut. It's Israel's 73rd Independence Day. And we wanted to mark this day with our new show, with you, our audience. The purpose of this show is to discuss current events in the Middle East, specifically from Israel, but our entire neighborhood, and to put things in context. Because of course, one of the things that we see in network news and in most news websites is that what they give you at best are plastic descriptions of what just happened five minutes ago without any context. And so it's very difficult to understand anything that's actually happening in the real world here in the Middle East. Um, so without further ado, first of all, I want to say hello to Gadi Taub. Hello, Hi, Dr. Carolyn. Gadi Taub. Hi. Hi. Mazal tov. Happy Mazal birthday. tov. Happy birthday, Israel. Happy birthday, Israel. And we're going to talk a little bit about Israel's birthday at the bottom of our broadcast. But today, I think the best way to start our first show is to talk about the main event this week, which is what happened in Iran to Iran's nuclear installation at Nantaz over the weekend. Um, and for a little bit of background, let me just uh, explain. So um, in 2002, the MEC, the Iranian Re opposition uh, organization, uh, uh, announced, revealed to the world that Iran had a secret military nuclear program and it had developed uh, two very important nuclear sites, one in Iraq and one in Antaz, uh, that were uh, about en uh, enriching uranium uh, towards the production of nuclear weapons and developing a heavy water reactor for the development of plutonium-based nuclear weapons. Since then, there have been a lot of efforts led by the United States or by Israel to try to curb Iran's nuclear uh, nuclear activities, to try to prevent them, to block them from acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, in 2015, then President Obama uh, negotiated and concluded what's called the JCPOA or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal. And the idea behind the deal was that Iran would agree to put temporary limitations on its nuclear activities. And in exchange, the United States would essentially legitimize both its nuclear program and its regional aggression. Um, and uh, that, of course, not surprisingly to the critics of the JCPOA, blocked, uh, did nothing to uh, stop in any way Iran from seeking to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, they systematically breached the agreement from the outset although nobody wanted to acknowledge it until President Trump came into office. And in May of 2018, he removed the United States from the nuclear deal and reasserted sanctions, economic sanctions that the United States had applied to Iran until 2015 uh, to try to uh, implement a new strategy of maximum pressure against Iran. All the while, Israel has been working in the backgrounds, according to foreign media reports, because Israel never acknowledges it, to try to stymie Iran's nuclear progress by taking a series of actions, whether it's uh, through cyber attacks on Iran's nuclear installations, specifically Nantaz, which I mentioned before, which is their main uranium enrichment uh, facility in the country. Uh, as of last weekend, there were over 6,000 centrifuges of various uh, pedigrees spinning to enrich uranium to at least 24% of purification, which is well on the way to the purification level necessary to make nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, so Israel's taken a lot of actions against Iran's nuclear scientists, against uh, nuclear installations, mainly through cyber attacks, some through uh, targeted hits of Iranian uh, leaders in the nuclear field to block again. Or, or, to Carolyn, as we say, as we say in Israel, According to foreign sources, Israel right. took always action. According to foreign, yeah. Always according to foreign sources. So this week, over the weekend, Israelis were pretty uh, alarmed because Iran, uh, well, first of all, back up. So in January 2021, the United States got a new president, Joe Biden. He reinstated much of Iran, much of Obama's nuclear team for negotiating the uh, the Iranian nuclear deal in 2015. And they've gone about very rapidly trying to cancel uh, Trump's nuclear policies and to readopt, re-implement uh, Obama's nuclear policies. And that includes, among other things, reinstating negotiations 
uh, towards the United States re-entering the nuclear deal, first and foremost by ending its economic sanctions against Iran. And in exchange, Iran is supposed to cut back some of its nuclear activities that are prohibited under the nuclear deal from 2015. Now, none of these plans were going to in any way block Iran from becoming a nuclear power by, you know, 2025, maximum 2030, because the deal ends formally and completely in 2030. But this is the policy that the Joe Biden administration is advancing. So over the weekend, uh, to celebrate their incredible nuclear progress, and some would say to poke their finger in the eye of the Biden administration's other would say, to express their contempt for the Biden administration. And others would say that just because they are pursuing nuclear weapons and they want to reach them as quickly as possible, Iran celebrated their National Nuclear Day. And during the uh, day, uh, leaders of the Iranian regime were praising all of the advances really throughout the country at dozens of nuclear sites throughout the country. And from an Israeli perspective, listening to this, since Iranian uh, leaders, including Supreme Leader Ali Khatamai, have repeatedly claimed that their goal and the goal of the nuclear project is to wipe Israel off the map, Israelis were pretty alarmed. And then on Sunday morning, we woke up to the surprising and not at all alarming news uh, that uh, Nantaz's uh, nuclear uh, site had been the site of an electrical failure. Uh, immediately, fingers started pointing at Israel. They were saying that it's going to take nine months for uh, the centrifuges in Iran, in, in Antaz, to begin uh, spinning again. Um, then later, uh, reports that there was also a detonation of some sort of an explosive device that has uh, caused severe damage to the uh, Natanz site. And this is, by the way, after last summer, um, there was another attack there that uh, caused severe damage to the centrifuges. So. Um, this was a cause for celebration in Israel. Again, foreign news reports, particularly the New York Times, uh, claimed that uh, the that Israel's Mossad spy agency was behind uh, the operation in Antares. Certainly, it wiped the smile off the face of the mullahs who were so excited about their nuclear pro progress, um, which in and of itself was a nice thing. I think um, we should. I think we should. Uh... We should see this in the context of the Biden appeasement policy, because what is going on is that it's really shameful. To, it's, it's almost pathetic to look at how the Iranians have become so cocky since the Biden administration uh, took power, because they kept saying, we're not even negotiating with you until you take off all the sanction. And you could see how the State Department and Blinken and the team that, that is in charge of the negotiation just bowed their head more and more. And I think that if you look at it in this context, then assuming that according to foreign source, that these foreign sources are right, which I think one might plausibly assume, then, th then if we look at the sequence, it might mean this. Israel understood that the United States is not going to do anything, that it's not going to do anything effective, and it is signaling to the Biden administration um, in accord, we must say, to what Netanyahu uh, said in his speech at the Holocaust Memorial Day, that any uh, agreement with this regime, uh, which will allow it to have uh, a nuclear program, would not Israel would not see as binding. And so if, assuming that this is what's, what's happened, then Israel is giving a very strong sign that if you surrender to these to these mullahs, then, then we will not. And I, 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 I want to add a little context in the, um, mm -hmm. in, in the general picture of the Middle East, because the, the real danger is not, I think, that Iran is going to use a, 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 a nuclear bomb against Israel. I think that the real danger is that the nuclear umbrella would enable it to advance its proxy forces and gener and take take over the Middle East because ir the Iranians are not part of the Arab world; they're part of the Muslim world. These are um, these are Shiite Sunnis, um, and they are and they are very astute. It's a very old civilization. I'm sure they think it's ridiculous that. That, that someone like, say, John Kerry is trying to outsmart them in negotiations. These people have been cheating in this Persian market um, for 3,000 years. So, so what they noticed is that the Arab world is collapsing. It's, we, we are witnessing a civilizational collapse. Um, 
any form of order is collapsing since the so-called Arab Spring, which the Obama administration was so enthusiastic about, uh, we see the collapse of nation states. And, it, and it, the principle of nationalism is, is, is not taking root in the Arab world. Pan-Arabism collapsed. Uh, political Islam has, has mostly generated wild growths like ISIS. And so the, the mullahs from Tehran have, have noted the vacuum. And what they're trying to do is to, um, to, to project their proxy forces into failed states. And we can see what's happening in Syria. We can see what's happening in Iraq. I think their next plan is Jordan. And if we end up surrounded by forces like Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, which is pointing some, something around between 50,000 and 100,000 rockets at Israel. 150,000, actually. It's 150,000. 150, all the more worrying. Um, right. And if we have another Hezbollah in Syria and another Hezbollah in in Jordan, then then Israel would be that would be an existential threat. This is why I we think can't agree I think you're it. right, but I think that I think that it's important to highlight it a little bit more. I think, and and here we, you know we have to really draw the distinction between how Israel is behaving and how the United States is behaving, and really how this has ha has impacted the strategic reality in in the region. Uh, in a way, I think that that's probably for 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 the good in, in many ways. Um, the United States, I think, uh, starting with the Bush administration, exposed an incredible uh, lack of understanding of the of the Arab world. Um, they they tried to uh, project uh, liberal democratic values onto uh, the Arab world, which has no history of liberal democracy. And we saw what happened in in Iraq as a result of that. Of that sort of frame of mind, you know, I was an embedded reporter. I, it was a privilege to be an embedded reporter with the Third Infantry Division in Iraq during the invasion in 2003. Actually, it was about 18 years ago this week that uh, Baghdad fell. Uh, the battalion that I was embedded with was the first uh, battalion at the airport in Baghdad. So, you know, I got a front row seat to this. And unfortunately, and the thing that really drove me crazy at the time, you know, I came from Israel where we were having suicide bombings every day in 2003 and 2002 and 2001 and 2000, um, is how innocent the Americans were. They were innocents abroad. They came in to the Middle East and they thought that they were liberating Paris in 1944. And uh, I think that that naivete of the Bush administration was uh, replaced with the Obama administration by a cynicism and, 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 a, and a, an anti-imperialist third world mindset, which was inherently anti-American, anti-American power, and therefore also anti-America's allies. You, you know, I, I, just, to, just to remark at the, on the margins, it, mm -hmm. it, I, my take on the Obama administration is this is the first president who is a student of Edward Said. Um, I know the origins of Obama's thought are, are with the uh, community organizing in, in Chicago, but I think that the, the frame of mind of the post-colonial Edward Said studies um, is now, we, we see this generation of politicians, and this is the thing, this is the, the, the paradigm that they grew up on, yeah. And I think, and, and here it's important to note that it's an anti-Western and also anti-intellectual concept of the of the world of the world at large of the islamic world and of the united states it makes every it's it's sort of critical race theory um brought into the international arena so white people bad uh non-white people or white people who aren't western good um, especially if they're anti-western and and so this kind of victimology of the international community really has had a deleterious effect on uh, on American strategic rationale. And we saw this with the nuclear deal because it empowered the world's uh, greatest uh, sponsor of terrorism and uh, of a regime that not only is highly repressive and tyrannical towards its own people, but I mean, again, you know, its leaders have pledged to annihilate Israel, an entire state, and also uh, the United States of America, and that they're developing the means both through uh, ballistic missiles and nuclear uh, technology to achieve their sought after and declared goal of genocide and obliteration of Israel. So I think that's important. And you're right, the, the Obama administration also viewed the Arab Spring as sort of this um, manifestation of, of a woke revolution in the Arab world. They did not understand, they elevated 
the worst elements of, of the Islamic world, they elevated the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a progenitor of Al-Qaeda, of, of, of uh, Hamas, of you know uh, all of the major Sunni Islamist jihadist uh, groups that have been operating in the Western world really since the mid-20th mid century. Um, and they elevated them to power in the largest Arab country in Egypt. And that, you know, if if the Egyptian military with the backing of the Saudis and the UAE hadn't ousted the Muslim Brotherhood government from power in the summer of 2013, then the Middle East that we're dealing with today, which is already complicated and riven with dangers, fraught with threats uh, to international security and to Israel specifically, then we would have been dealing with a completely different um reality and, and exactly and and what i said about jordan is to, if you imagine the, the bleak picture if obama had his way completely then then jordan would fall uh, to proxy forces from the shiites the the iranian extremists and the muslim brotherhoods in egypt they are sunnis but one must remember that they are perfectly happy to cooperate between them because iran would be happy to support hamas against israel so if we would have the muslim brotherhood in egypt and in turkey and then the shiites uh, take over of the whole um, eastern side of the well, what what of, king of the Abdallah, what king abdallah of jordan referred to as the shiite crescent which he warned the americans when they entered iraq was going to extend from Iran through Iraq into Syria, down to Lebanon, and then, of course, we've seen into Gaza through the Hamas terror regime there. Um, he warned about this already in 2003, and 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 it's really uh, taken a, a form. And so that actually just makes me want to just focus in a little bit on on the distinction between Israel's uh, it between Israel's um, strategy for contending with this and the American strategy for contending with this, because you know I started this by just saying you know the Americans really have uh, lost a connection to the mothership. I mean, I mean the Americans, uh, you know, God bless them, uh, they had a concept which was we're really big, we go in, we break things, and then we leave because. If we learn one thing from Vietnam, is we just don't understand what other people want from us. And in a way, you know, it was interesting. When I was in Iraq, they showed us the war plan, and it ended at the Baghdad airport. And and I looked at them and I said, well, "What happens after that?" And the uh, brigade commander of uh, it was the first uh, first brigade of the uh, Third Infantry Division that I was embedded with. He looked at me and said. What do you mean? And I said, well, okay, what happens after the uh, airport uh, it falls to U.S. forces? And they didn't really have a game plan, which became very clear in the months after that. But maybe if the Americans had just followed their plan, uh, brought down, you know, caused a strategic shock inside of Iraq, and then left, you know, things might have changed in a in a in a good way. But what happened was after they got to the end of their plan, which took about three three and a half weeks. They just started a whole new plan. They decided that this was all about bringing, bringing democracy, democracy to yeah. Iraq, and and that was largely because they didn't find any chemical weapons. So the initial goal, which was to end the chemical weapons drive, sort of morphed into this new amorphous concept of bringing democracy, and and that and didn't this, work this at all. This is not new. Americans fall into this trap repeatedly, and and I think partly because Americans misunderstand their own nationalism. If if you, you'll excuse my making the observation as a foreigner, and there's a long tradition of foreigners telling Americans who they are, um, but I think Americans don't see that they have a national identity, and so they come into Iraq and they think, oh, it's like America. We'll have, a, it'll be hyphenated. We'll have Sunni Iraqis, Shiite Iraqis, and Kurd Iraqis. It will be a multicultural democracy. We just need to give them our constitution. And what they don't understand and there, there is no such thing as Iraqi. There is nothing binding these people together. And so you come with, a, with an alien concept of democracy. And first of all, democracy can never be imposed. It's like love, right? You can't, you can't force people to have a democracy. You they can't don't hurry, it. love. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so they come with this concept, and it's a, it's a completely wrong concept. There is nothing binding. The only thing that was binding Iraqis together was the boot of Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party. And so I, I wrote some things that we, well, the people saw them as cynicism, which, it, which they weren't. But I said they should behead. Saddam Hussein is, is a Stalinist dictator and, 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 and really dangerous. They should behead the Ba'ath Party, but leave the Ba'ath Party there. Because if you don't, you will have chaos, not You not know, there were, there were Americans, there were Americans who agreed with you, and uh, they were viewed 
um, askance uh, because they were people were saying, what are you talking about? You can't doom these people to continued life under tyranny. And again, part of this was a need for a rationale for invading another country and then not being able to find chemical weapons. So a lot of this was also the result of um, I don't actually even think it was an intelligence failure. I think it was an unwillingness to see Iraq not as nation state, but as part of a larger system of what Bush rightly referred to as the axis of evil, because you know Israel was already reporting in the lead up in the five and six months before the war that uh, Evgeny Primakov, which was, who was Russia's uh, foreign uh, minister at the time, gone met with Saddam. And then you saw these very large convoys of, uh, of uh, trucks moving from, suspicious trucks moving from Baghdad to Syria across the border. And then later, a lot of those chemical weapons were used in the Syrian war by Assad against his own people. So, you know, there was a, there was a rat, you know, rat trail that was going from Iraq into Syria, but nobody wanted to go into Syria because that goes into a whole lot of other mis- understandings of the Americans about the nature of the conflict against Israel. And once but you I, move think the, Iraq, I think there's, you know, al there's also a difference between uh, between the, the, the Bush and the Obama uh, frame of mind. Both are mistaken. I don't want to minimize the disaster that Bush brought on here with the, with the, with the inability to understand the, the realities of the Middle East. But he had a very mainstream American liberal concept. And then came a progressive president with a completely different pro uh, uh, frame of mind. Yeah, I think that you're and right. he was not bringing democracy to, um, I, I want to remind right. everyone that when, when there were democratic demonstrations against the regime in Iran, in Iran, Obama just turned his back to them and refused to support them even morally because, because the progressive frame of mind has a completely different plan. And this plan is to, to empower the downtrodden or the, the third world. And so the wretched of the, the, wretched the, wretched of the, of the earth. The, and so maybe, maybe our, our friend Lee Smith, the, the investigative journalist, um, is right in his assessment that the, the, the idea was not to limit Iran at all. The idea was to empower Iran and finally to let them That's have a, well, that well, Yes, yes. But let me just, I think it's yep. very important just to back up a little bit because we've gone far afield as, as is our want. And it's important because all of these things are important and bear you know, more in-depth discussion. But I want to just go back to Iran and what's happening today for a second. So I think it's important for people to understand. Look, um, there is uh, the American goal, like formally speaking, is we want to delay Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons and allow other things to happen. If we give them a lot of money, if we give them international legitimacy, then they're going to set, set aside their nuclear ambitions and they'll be uh, responsible members of the international community. This is a fantasy, but this is these are the talking points of the of the Obama administration before and now the Biden administration, um, and um, and this is sort of the the policy that they're formally pursuing, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work at all. So Israel has another policy, and Israel has to walk a very tight line for reasons that have to do both with dis d disagreements inside of Israel about what our role in preventing Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons should be. And, uh, and and limitations on our capabilities, certainly to openly oppose the United States in respect to Iran. So what Israel has done is it's and and we see it today, and we you know with, with the with the attack attributed to Israel in Ataz and and other ones in the assassination of the father of Iran's nuclear weapons program, uh, Motion uh, Fakhrizada, a few months ago, and so on and so forth, is that. Israel also, Israel's actual policy is to do what the United States says it's going to do. It's not, um, and it's arguable that this is wrong, but it's not to uh, abolish, to uh, obliterate, to destroy Iran's ability to, defend, to, to develop nuclear weapons. If Israel has that capacity, we certainly had uh, several years to try to build up that capacity uh, through bunker buster bombs. So it's not though to destroy the Nantaz facility root and branch or the other facilities in Isfahan or Iraq or Qom or where have you. It's to do what the Americans say that they want to do, which is to postpone Iran's ability to develop and field nuclear weapons. And so Israel does this by continuously identifying and then targeting, sometimes with incredible creativity, key sites inside of Iran's nuclear installations to postpone their their 
their ability to develop nuclear weapons. Um, and so each time it's a different aspect of this program. Sometimes it's the same place, like Nantaz has been attacked twice because it's so important, or three times actually. So it can be a combination of things, but that is Israel's policy. And Israel doesn't do it by appeasing or by legitimizing or taking the mullahs at their words when they say that they're going to curtail their nuclear operations. To the contrary, Israel doesn't trust them. Israel doesn't legitimize Iran's nuclear program the way that the United States does. Israel continuously delegitimizes Iran's uh, uh, nuclear program and their so-called right to develop the means to annihilate the Jewish state. Um, and Israel is very focused on this. And in the same way, um, you were talking before about encirclement and what the actual existential threat to Israel is. And I would argue that absolutely nuclear weapons in the hands of the Iranians is in and of itself an, uh, an existential threat. But it's not the only threat that Iran is able to pose to Israel's existence. As you mentioned, the weapons, the missiles that, that Hezbollah fields together with Hamas in Gaza and so on and so forth, all together, taken together, Iran's proxy forces throughout, you know, all around Israel have the ability to launch, you know, more than 4,000 missiles on Israel every day for weeks and weeks and weeks in the event that we find ourselves again in open war with them, as we did in 2006 with Hezbollah in, in, uh, in and, Lebanon. And the Biden administration, like the Obama administration, is refusing to condition all the agreements on limiting their missile programs and their other ways to, to sponsor terrorism. But you would also you are also critical of Trump's uh, policy. Towards I am. Iran. But first, I just want to I just want to say one more point before we close the parentheses about Iran's uh, regional threat to Israel, which is this. Um, Israel has for years been pursuing a strategy that it has developed uh, in conjunction with Russia, which is another one of the big disgraces and, and disasters of, Iran's, of Obama's Middle East policy, which is that when Obama showed that he was feckless and he wasn't actually going to do anything in the face of Bashar Assad's genocide of Syria's Sunni population at the behest of his Iranian overlords during the civil war, when he was using civil when he was using chemical weapons against uh, his own people, but they weren't his because they were Sunnis and, and causing a massive refugee flow of Syrians into Europe and so on and so forth, and really gave birth to ISIS through all of this. Um, Russia said, "Oh, there's a power vacuum. Oh, we, you know, Iran is our is our um, ally or erstwhile ally or our proxy state or client state or whatever we would like them to be." And certainly the Syrian regime under Assad, both the father and the son have been our uh, proxies or our client states. Israel threw Russia out of Syria and, in the, uh, and of the region as a whole in 1982 in a very famous air battle in the Lebanon war. And after that, the Soviets left the Middle East for the first time. And then because of Obama's incredible fecklessness uh, and fear of angering Iran at the same time that he was trying to uh, woo the Iranians to agree to this ridiculous nuclear deal, the, the Russians returned to Syria. And the implication for Israel was a disaster because it was the first time since 1982 that Israel lost its aerial superiority in the region. Because the Russians are there and they were putting in S-400 anti-aircraft batteries and so on and so forth. So what Prime Minister Netanyahu did was he rushed to Russia and he made a deal with the Russians that Israel just wanted to work in Syria to block Iran from transferring uh, precision guided missiles from uh, Iraq uh, through Syria and into and into Lebanon. And what this has done to understand the implications strategically of what this has done for Israel, all we have to do is look at the threat that the Houthis pose and mount in the, their assaults against Saudi Arabia, that because the Houthis, which is another Iranian proxy in Yemen, have precision guided missiles and drones that they've received from the Iranians. Uh, they're able to have strategic attacks against Saudi Arabia's most important sites, their uh, refineries their, and their other uh, oil uh, installations uh, uh, that are all within range of Yemen and the Houthi regime in Yemen, the Iranian controlled Houthi regime in, in Yemen. So if Israel weren't, it hadn't been able to develop this deal with uh, Putin, uh, to enable Israel, despite Russia's uh, air superiority now in the region, to operate against Iranian arms shipments to Hezbollah, 
then the threat that we were facing today in Lebanon would be the same as the threat that the Saudis face from Yemen. So I think that that's very important to understand. So Israel, our policy basically has been a blocking action and working with whomever we can to push away both Iran's uh, date of acquisition of new independent nuclear capabilities, military nuclear capabilities, and also to block Iran from tur turning Lebanon into Yemen and turning Israel into Saudi Arabia. And I think that this is this is a very key point because both taken separately, Iran's missile threat through its proxies that encircle Israel and Iran's nuclear threat, Iran is an acute threat to Israel. And in Israel itself, you know, Every time I think about is Israel's security brass and how they have been dealing with the concept of Iran's nuclear weapons program since really 2002, I, I don't know if you, I'm sure you saw the great dictator. Yep. So there's this scene, it starts where he's an artillery guy in World War One, right? And, and, and the Western Front or the Eastern Front for the Germans. And uh, he's like at the back of a line of soldiers Charlie Chaplin, I'm sorry. Yeah. So Charlie Chaplin is like the private and in front of him is a corporal and a sergeant and a first lieutenant and on and, 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 and So the big guy uh, tell, turns to the guy behind him, the second in charge and says, you light the cannon. And then the, he turns to the next one. He says, you light the cannon and so on and so forth till they get to the private Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin looks behind him and he's stuck. He's the one who has to light the cannon and he doesn't know whether the ball is going to you know, actually go to the French or whether it's going to uh, blow up and kill him. And so that that's the joke that everybody's looking for the guy in behind, behind him. And in Israel, you know, we're Charlie Chaplin, right? Because we're, we're the number one target on Iran's list of targets. So, you know, the Americans, I remember famously in the 2008 presidential primaries, when she was running against Obama, Hillary Clinton gave this statement that was embraced by what I considered then and still now brain dead American Jewish organizations where she said that if Iran nukes Israel, the United States will nuke Iran. And everybody, yeah, yeah. and I thought, what? Wait, 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 I don't like this picture. You know, what, what are you saying? You're saying, and, and actually from an American perspective, her idea is completely sane because they're number two. So, yeah. When 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 we're no longer in front of them, they'll go after them. From an Israeli perspective, she gave away the game. She said, you're on your own. As long as you're number one, we're fine with that. And that has really been the position of, of, uh, that, of the Obama administration and now of the Biden administration, to the extent that they would ever do anything against Iran, they certainly won't do it so long as we're number one. We're Charlie Chaplin. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a bad way to try and pacify Israel. I, I, I agree. We don't, <laughs> we don't root for that. Um, but, but the big difference now on the ground, I think, is that un, that, that working with the Trump administration, um, it, it, Israel, suppose, supposing that, that these attributed attacks are really Israeli, uh, operated under the cover of ambiguity of a policy of ambiguity. And so we were not directly responsible ever. And now what seems to be happening is that the Biden administration, like the Obama administration, is deliberately leaking to point the finger at Israel on its way to crawling back to the, to, to the agreement with, with Iran. And, the, and what this does is it limits Israel room of maneuvering. And I think that in this sense, the attack on Nantaz was, was exactly the right thing to do. It's like, if you blow the cover of ambiguity, we would still act even more directly. And, and, and the game here is, is very high stakes for Israel because, because I think that the, the way Netanyahu managed the Obama administration very astutely in his speech in Congress, which I, I confess I was on the left and it horrified me. I thought, what are you doing? And apparently he did the right thing because it, it didn't work with, with carrots. So it had to work with sticks. And the stick that Israel, that Israel really held at the time was that I think it, it, it imagined at least it had enough traction that it could threaten to drag America into a war with Iran. And this would have been, it's, it's, a, it's a very frightening threat for Israel because 
Israel does not want to drag its biggest ally, ally into a war that Americans don't want, especially after the Iraq fiasco and, and the age of retracting American forces. So, so here is maybe where we disagree, Carolyn, because, because I thought that, that Trump was, was, was doing the right thing by applying very strong sanctions and, and, and not directly involving American forces. I, I have to note in, uh, on the margins of this that I, I had the privilege of interviewing uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo just recently on my own podcast. And he said that the, Oba that the Trump administration was willing to use any means at the disposal of the United States to stop the nuclear program. That is, at least according to him, their, their actual real fallback position was military. Daddy, I think one of the things that's important, you know, you mentioned uh, Netanyahu's speech to the Joint Houses of Congress in 2015. And um, I think it's really important to understand that this wasn't just a simple speech. You know, his detractors here in Israel and in the United States claim that he was doing a public diplomacy or what we called uh, or what we call in Israel has barah effort in the United States and that there was no purpose to doing public diplomacy when you're dealing with a strategic issue of this level. But I think that the thing that people misunderstood at the time that he gave the speech and since, and particularly his detractors, and I think that a lot of them are deliberately deceiving the, the implications of the speech, is that that speech wasn't just a speech. It was a strategic gambit. Basically, its purpose was to signal uh, a couple of things. One is um, it was to communicate just how dangerous this is to the American people. And the implication of that was that uh, every single Republican presidential contender in the Republican primaries in 2015 and 2016 committed to removing the United States uh, from the nuclear deal, from disavowing the nuclear deal, galvanized the Republican Party as a whole, both in the Senate and in the House, to oppose the nuclear deal. And until then, Obama's influence campaign, his communication strategy was to demonize everybody who opposed it. So simply by coming to the United States and giving this speech, uh, Netanyahu legitimized American opposition to uh, Obama's nuclear deal. And that was very important. But even more important than what it did in the United States is what it did in the region. By openly defying the U.S. administration and its really uh, dangerous diplomacy with Tehran, uh, Netanyahu presented Israel as a credible ally for the Sunni Arab states in the Middle East that are terrified, were terrified under Obama and continue to be terrified now under Biden, and what they view as America's betrayal of them uh, on behalf of Iran. So whether it's the Saudis, first and foremost, the Egyptians, the UAE, <clears throat> um, Jordan. and um, Jordan to a lesser degree because, because they're so weak and, and, and they have a lock on a lot of the foreign policy elite in the United States regardless. Um, I think that uh, 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 Netanyahu said Israel is a credible ally um, Israel is going to secure the goals that the United States claims that it's seeking to achieve, but we're going to actually do them. We're not going to allow Iran to acquire nuclear weapons. We understand the threat that it poses to the region, not only to ourselves, but to all of you. And I think that that opened the floodgates of strategic cooperation between Israel and the Sunnis. And this was before the Abraham Accords were even, you know, a twinkle in Donald Trump's eye. I mean, he still wasn't running for president at the time. So I think you know, that in and of itself, it was a strategic move. And of course, it was a deterrent force against Iran. So I think that, you know, these two things were very important. And, and you know, in 2009, when, when Obama came into power, uh, he, two months later, Netanyahu was elected uh, to serve as prime minister for the second time. He had been uh, there under the Clinton administration from 96 to 99. And Rahm Emanuel, who was uh, Clinton's, uh, who was uh, who was Obama's, Obama's chief, of, chief staff, of staff, yeah and had worked in the Clinton administration, he thought, well, we brought down Netanyahu in 2000 and in 1999, we sided with Barack and we were able to subvert his government and bring him down. We're gonna do the same thing now. And he said so pretty much openly uh, upon entering office or after Netanyahu formed his goal of government. Um, and he failed. And the reason they failed is because they didn't understand that Israeli society had changed, that we had undergone 10 years of unrelenting Palestinian suicide bombing and Israelis were simply not interested in trying to um, make a remake of the Oslo Accords in 2009, 2010. So 
they didn't understand the changes in Israeli society. And I think today we're seeing a repeat of that blindness that we saw in relation to Israel, in relation to the strategic dynamics, strategic dynamics of, of the Middle East, that the Biden administration thinks that they're going to be able to come in and talk about the Palestinians and uh, attack Israel for trying to bring down Iran's nuclear efforts or whatever, and that the Arabs are going to side with the Americans because they care about the Palestinians more than they do their own survival. And so I think that we're seeing an overreach here of the Biden administration people that they don't recognize that Israel is acting in alliance with the Saudis, with the UAE, and with other Arab states to block Iran's nuclear ambitions. Whether Israel is doing all the heavy lifting on its own or not is almost beside the point. The point is that the strategic dynamics that began really to unfold at that speech in 2015 by Netanyahu, they've already uh, moved forward another five, five and a half years since then. So I think that the strategic environment here is altered to Iran's detriment and to the detriment of those seeking to appease Iran at the expense of Israel and the Saudis and the, and the other Sunni Arab states. But we'll just have to see how things uh, work out. You know, I, I did want to just, uh, because it is Yom mood, it's Israel's Independence Day, um, that we're launching our first uh, our first show, I, I think it's really important for us to talk about Israeli independence and yeah. what it means and why we're so happy today. And when we're done with this show, we're going to go out and we're going to, you know, have uh, have barbecues and celebrate with our families and our loved ones. Um, and why, what is this? What was the seminal moment on the 5th of the Jewish month of ER in the Jewish year of 5708 or the 15th of May, 1948? What happened? And how do people look at it and how they should look at it? So why don't you start? I, I, I think, you know, I had an argument in, I was a member of the Metzila think tank uh, under my dear friend, Professor Ruth Gavison, uh, um, also winner of the Israel Prize for uh, for jurisprudence. And and there was an argument there about the law of return. And and some of the people- Explain to our viewers what the law of return is. The law of return it. is the law that grants any Jew or a spouse of a Jew and the son of a Jew and the grandchild of a Jew, automatic citizenship in Israel, and it's full citizenship, including the right to vote. And some people have said in, in that in Metzila uh, debate, they said, well, isn't it about time that we start making this a gradual process so that people can't vote immediately on landing in Ben Gurion Airport, before they know anything about Israeli politics, before they know Hebrew, before they can read our papers, and and, and I took the radical position that the law, which is in, it's radical in logically, it's it's very common in Israel that we should preserve the law of return as is, because what Zionism has meant is that Jews would again be sovereign over their own fate. It, 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 if I can quote our Declaration of Independence, it is Please. the natural right of the Jewish people to be like all peoples, masters of their own fate in their own sovereign state. And so this is almost, it, it's the closest that it can come to holy for a secular person that when you touch when you touch down, when you walk your first step on the asphalt of the tarmac in Ben Gurion, you are a sovereign citizen. You are no longer a subject of wh wherever you came from. And some people came from democratic countries, that's fine, but some people come from despotic countries. So this is the, the, the Ben Gurion, when he was asked, what is the core of Zionism referred to this? Independence is the core of Zionism. We will be in his beautiful Hebrew. Anashim omdim birshut atzmam, translated traditionally as masters of their own fate, but in command of themselves. And so, and so, I think uh, since we are, since our perspective is a conservative one, uh, we may note that part of the struggle within Israel itself is that generally the left has given up on Israel's sovereignty in many ways, and maybe the most. Um, uh, a indicative one is that the the radical left has has turned to international institutions in order to impose its agenda because it has given up on convincing the Israeli public. Uh, now democracy, with all its troubles and all its flaws, one thing is central. 
It's the government with the consent of the government. If you want to change something, you have to win an election. And it's, it's a really bad sign of the, the corruption of, of democracy in Israel, and especially among its elites. As you know, I'm a, I'm a critic of our elites quite consistently, is that they have given up on convincing us and are now trying to force our hand, whether through the judici judiciary or whether through international institutions. Yadi, I think it's really important to talk about all of the threats that Israel faces to its sovereignty, both in terms of domestic subversion and in terms of foreign intervention, foreign diplomatic warfare, uh, foreign warfare inside of Israel itself. I think it's very important for us to fight those things, as you and I have both done vol in, in voluminous writings uh, in the newspapers and other places here in Israel and abroad. And I think it's important, uh, and we're going to devote probably several uh, episodes of this show to that specific issue. But I think that on Israel independence and Yom Atzmut, it's important to stop for a second and to understand the immensity of the achievement of what the Jewish people have done in the land of Israel over the past 73 years. Um, you know, when Israel was founded 73 years ago, 6% of the Jewish people lived in Israel, 6% out of, out of 11 and a half million Jews worldwide after the Holocaust, uh, only 650,000 lived in Israel. Uh, by way of comparison, 5 million Jews lived in the United States. They were, I think, 43% of the overall Jewish population in the world. Uh, today, 73 years on, 6.9 million Jews live in Israel. And although 500,000 Jews have immigrated to the United States over the intervening decades, today's Jewish population in the United States stands at 5.7 million um, by, uh, by some estimates. So what, what we see with that is that all, all of the demographic growth of the Jewish people has taken place in Israel. Today, we have 14.8.9 million Jews worldwide. Uh, so everything redounds to Israel. And it's not just demography. Israel is the center of the Jewish world. It is the Jewish present. It is the Jewish future, uh, you know, from everything from Jewish literature, uh, prayer, uh, science, medicine, um, cuisine, uh, almost all major events in the Jewish world, Jewish, uh, Jewish leaps forward are all happening in Israel, all of them, everything. And I think that this puts paid the concept that you can be an anti-Zionist and oppose Israel's right to exist and not be an anti-Semite. Of course, that's obscene, it's absurd, and that idea has to be thrown away. But more to the point, I mean, I think you know, we have developed a, a society that is more dynamic, more forward thinking, and actually wealthier, more prosperous than anybody would have imagined just 73 years ago. You know, uh, GDP per capita in Israel is higher than it is in Japan. We're at over $40,000 per year uh, on average for Israeli citizens. This is something that nobody ever could have possibly imagined. I think we have every reason to believe uh, that our children will be more prosperous and have more opportunity to, and be freer than we are here in Israel and more secure, which is an amazing thing. The idea that we're passing on the ability for our children to actually have better lives than we. And by the way, I think from uh, the perspective of Jews throughout time, just looking at the whole span of Jewish history, the Jewish people have never been freer, have never been safer. There's never been more Torah learning from the religious perspective, and also from the non-religious perspective, more Jewish literacy, higher levels of Jewish literacy of Jewish specific texts than there is among Israeli Jews. And I think all of these things point to uh, something that nobody could have imagined. You know, when, when Israel was founded, um, everybody uh, thought that we were a, a welfare case and that we were dependent on the kindness of strangers or diaspora Jewry that was going to come to our aid and give us money and put their money into the, you know, the blue, uh, the blue banks, the little banks of the Jewish, Jewish United Fund. And today, Israelis are beginning to understand that we actually have a role to play in, in maintaining or saving or enabling Jewish life outside of Israel. And this is something that nobody could have possibly imagined. So. You know, I think we have to talk more about this now. I mean, we're a grown up. That's the other thing. You know, we're, we've always seen ourselves as a young country. We're still young, relatively speaking, for, for an independent state like India. Um, but we're also grown ups. And I think, you know, our goal and, our, and I think that the, that the real duty of our generation 
is to our generation, we're already old and we're raising, uh, thankfully, you know, new generation, which hopefully be better. But it, it's to accept that Israel is now an adult on the world stage. We are, and the, also, and also, Caroline, that we are not an example of anything. We are an actual state. This is not a rehearsal. We are not an right. ornament. We are not a test case to prove whether Jews are this or that. We're an actual sovereign country, and and we're certainly not an ornament for the rest of the Jewish world. Um, we're not here to to um, to serve. Make them feel good about themselves. About themselves, exactly. Yeah. Gadi, you're right. You're absolutely right. Israel isn't an example. We're not a we're not a tree ornament. You know, we are a living, breathing place. And all I want to say in short is how lucky we are to be living in this time. You know, I mean, Judaism, Jewish life in Israel is the fabric of this country, something that, you know, our our ancestors, wherever they were living, could it wouldn't even dare to dream is true. It's just the way we are. And we have so much to be grateful for, for the people who came before us. And we have so much to preserve and to conserve and to hand on to our children. And really, I think that our duty as the adults uh, today, you know, and this is 30 years since I made Ali on May 28th, 1991, I moved here. I put down my, uh, my tent pin and I said, I'm not leaving. And I haven't amazingly, but is that, you know, I understood that this, I believed that this was going to happen. And I see in front of my eyes over the past 30 years that Israel is really living out its promise. And we have to do everything that we can to preserve this, to continue to, to, to defend and to empower and to strengthen this country still more. And I think that we have every reason to believe that our children going forward are going to, you know, have an even more prosperous and a stronger country, more exciting place and everything that we're doing just keeps on building. And it, I'm so I'm so grateful that I had the foresight to, to make my life here. And I hope that uh, we'll have the company of many more Jews in the years to come and that, we'll, and that we will continue to understand the blessings of our freedom, to preserve them, protect them, and expand on them into the next generation. So, Amen, I, sister. Thank you. Chag Sameach. Happy uh, Independence Day to all of you. Thank you for tuning in at this historic moment. The launch, <laughs> the launch, the historic launch after so many years of the Carolyn Glick show with Gotti Taub. And we're going to change the name as soon as you get used to Gotti Taub. But at any rate, which is hard uh, to do, admittedly. Well, I got used to it. Yeah. yeah, you're coming over later, right? For steaks. Yeah, right? absolutely. Okay. So we'll we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much for joining us and more to come. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much.